Secondly, it has a very important activity in forged passports. I will give you an example. Before the Curiel group was arrested, their apartments were searched. 1,000 passports were found, which is considerable, out of which 200 were designated to be sent to Turkey, probably for the Armenian terrorists. And I shall add that it is possible that one of the forged passports from Cyprus that was used by one of the terrorists who blasted the synagogue on the Rue Campagnique in Paris, this passport probably came from the Curiel organization. Another very important activity is instruction. It provides clandestine instruction in terrorism, in propaganda, in agitation, in ways of avoiding police observation, and, to the contrary, how to spy on police operations. It is a clandestine school, and some of its teachers are longtime members of the Communist Party, who had belonged to the French resistance combat units during the German occupation. One must add one more detail. These courses were given in religious institutions, which provided wonderful cover, because police hesitate to search church buildings or simple religious institutions which, on the surface, appear perfectly respectable. And finally, it's possible that the Curiel group has provided arms, although that could never be proven. What has been proven is that the group has made contacts possible between terrorists, subversive organizations, and certain politicians. And in that matter, Curiel, who was a very intelligent man, was an extraordinary go-between, and in my opinion, a brilliant mind in this task. In May of 1981, the world was shocked at the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II. The press reported that the gunman, Mehmet Ali Akça, may have been connected with right-wing groups in Turkey. Investigations since that time have uncovered the fact that Akça was a frequent traveler to communist Bulgaria. He was known to have stayed at the finest hotels, and his lifestyle was extravagant. Have you received your mother's letter? Your mother's letters. The H2B report, published in Monaco, was one of the first private information services to reveal the whole story of Akça. It is compiled by Hilaire du Berrier, a longtime foreign correspondent who maintains extensive diplomatic and intelligence contacts throughout the world. There was a meeting, they had a meeting, the Russians called a meeting, and um, in uh, um, Sofia, Bulgaria. And delegates of all of the um, Warsaw Bloc nations were there, except from Poland, which was very significant. And uh, they decided at that meeting that uh, Poland, the Polish government, the Polish Communist Party, and Russia could deal with solidarity in Poland if, if solidarity could be stripped of its support from a Polish pope. And there it was decided that something had to be done to him. And nobody wanted to come out and say, kill the man. They said something, ha he has to be silenced. But the word kill was never used. 158 is imputed. Muhammad Ali Agcha was given a uh, notice to hold himself on readiness. Uh, he traveled on various passports and uh, <clears throat> he went into Russian Crimea, into a training camp, and there he received the training. Very interesting that he was put through hours and hours of target practice, shooting at a moving target in the form of the Pope's body. The existence of an interlocking terrorist network, supported directly and indirectly by the Soviet Union, is well documented. And that leads to the second obvious pattern of terrorism. It's the fact that the leaders of these groups, almost without exception, claim to be acting in the name of Marx and Lenin. A further analysis reveals that these people are not the product of the working class which they claim to represent, but come from the privileged middle class and upper class. They're intellectuals with college educations, and in fact, it's within the university environment 
that they first become steeped in the theories of Marx and Lenin. Yasser Arafat, leader of the PLO, had entered the University of Cairo in 1951. He was the son of a wealthy merchant from Gaza. In 1956, he was president of the leftist Palestine Student Union and was its delegate that year to the Communist World Festival of Youth in Prague, Czechoslovakia. In November of 1974, Arafat traveled to Moscow where he placed a wreath at the tomb of Lenin and was the personal guest of Leonid Brezhnev. In West Germany, the most active terrorist group is the Red Army Fraction, commonly called the Bader Meinhof Gang. It is an outgrowth of the radical student movement that flourished at German universities in the 1960s. The German Red Army Fraction was founded by Andreas Bader and Erliki Meinhof. Meinhof previously had been married to the publisher of a new left magazine called Konkret, featuring articles on recreational drugs, soft pornography, and radical politics. Both she and her husband were members of the Communist Party in West Germany from 1956 to 1962, and they received $400,000 from the Communist government of East Germany to subsidize their magazine and to support leftist student organizations at the Free University of Berlin. In Italy, the largest and most active terrorist organization is the Red Brigades. It has a disciplined central membership of well over 500, with close supporters and part-time activists numbering into the thousands. The Red Brigades was formed by Renato Curcio and his wife Margarita Cajol, who began their revolutionary careers as students at the University of Trent. They were activists in the youth branch of the Italian Communist Party, and also in one of the party's more militant factions called the Metropolitan Left. In Ireland, revolutionary terrorism was introduced many decades ago by the Irish Republican Army, known today as the official IRA. But in recent times, that role has been taken over by a splinter organization called the Provisional IRA. Bernadette Devlin has been one of the revolutionary's most eloquent spokesmen. A product of Belfast University, she became closely affiliated with the Fourth International, which is a worldwide grouping of communist revolutionary organizations that revere the memory and teachings of Leon Trotsky. In September of 1979, provisional IRA spokesman Rory O'Brady explained to the press the goals of his organization. He said, we want a democratic socialist republic, Marxist in analysis, similar to communism. By 1981, Nicaragua had been taken over by a group of revolutionaries called the Sandinistas. Between five and 6,000 Cubans now are training the new armed forces. The country is swarming with technicians and instructors from the Soviet Union, East Germany, Bulgaria, Vietnam, and North Korea. Weapons are supplied by Cuba, and runways have been extended to accommodate Russian MiGs. Humberto Ortega, the Minister of Defense explained the nature of the new regime when he said, Our revolution has a profoundly anti-imperialist character. We are anti-Yankee. We are guided by scientific doctrine, by Marxism-Leninism. In the United States, the Weather Underground Organization is a direct outgrowth of the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. One of its better-known members is Kathy Budin, who was arrested in 1981 following the robbery of a Brinks armored truck in Nyack, New York. Budin attended Bryn Mawr College in the United States and then went to the Soviet Union to spend her senior year there studying at Moscow University. Later, she became a teacher on a Soviet collective farm. The Weather Underground organization officially describes itself as follows. A revolutionary organization of communist men and women our goal is the destruction of U.S. imperialism and the achievement of a classless state, world communism. It's important to acknowledge the fact that not all terrorists around the world are members of the Communist Party under discipline from Moscow. But most of them are self-proclaimed Marxist-Leninists who are dedicated to exactly the same revolutionary theories and objectives to which the Soviets are dedicated. There's no fundamental conflict between them. And the terrorists serve the purpose of the Soviet Union, even though that may not be their primary intent. 
It's interesting to observe how people sometimes use words not to communicate ideas, but to conceal them. For example, while there may be terrorism in the world, there are no terrorists, at least not in their vocabulary. Those who commit these acts never refer to themselves as terrorists, but as revolutionaries. In fact, the very essence of Marxism-Leninism is the adoption of a whole dictionary of words and phrases that have quite different meanings than what they seem to have. The reality is that the Soviet Union has been pursuing the annexation of every non-communist nation in the world, but they describe that process as assisting the downtrodden peoples of those countries in throwing off their chains of imperialism, colonialism, or racism. This is not conquest, you understand. This is what they call a war of national liberation. When the revolutionaries finally come to power and begin to kill off their political opposition to consolidate control, they describe that as defending the revolution against its enemies, the traitors, the greedy capitalists, and the militarists who would re-enslave the peasants and workers. It means the right of self-determination, that people will have the right to determine their own destiny, to live free of uh, especially external oppression, to live free of imperialism, uh, of foreign domination, and the right to decide for themselves rather than to have uh, uh, decisions uh, forced upon them. Robert F. Williams was one of the original advocates of revolutionary violence on behalf of black Americans. Wanted by the FBI in 1961 on a kidnapping charge, he fled to Cuba and began publishing a series of propaganda tracts called The Crusader, which were smuggled into the United States through Canada. The Crusader declared that black Americans constituted an oppressed colony within the United States, a nation within a nation and called for a violent revolutionary war of national liberation to free that colony from the oppressive yoke of racism and capitalist exploitation. He also had a radio program beamed into the southern United States by the powerful transmitters of Radio Havana. And in these broadcasts, he called for armed insurrection against Whitey and against Yankee imperialism. Prepare the razor, the switchblade, the bullet, the gas bomb and the match put the torch to the racist strongholds of the city. Williams also traveled to Red China and became the honored guest of Mao Zedong and Chou Enlai. In 1969, he returned to the United States. At this time, the original kidnapping charges were dropped and he was given a teaching fellowship at the University of Michigan under a grant from the Ford Foundation. To a certain extent, the revolution in Cuba was a revolution for self-determination. The revolution in China was a revolution of self-determination. And there are Americans who will say, oh, but uh, China was not a colony. Oh, but Cuba was not a colony. Yes, but they had to take dictation from the United States. And the uh, United States had control of those countries, of those puppet governments, and Cuba was no more than a puppet of the United States. And you take them, you see, the Indians are supposed to They've had treaties. They're supposed to be an independent nation, and uh, many of the tribes. And uh, the United States government is not honoring, they're not honoring uh, the treaties they signed with the Indians. They're oppressed people, and uh, they all, they've all but been exterminated. Puerto Rico is uh, an oppressed, impoverished uh, nation. And the black people in this country, we are an impoverished nation. The rhetoric of revolution is the same everywhere in the world, with only slight modification to fit the unique circumstances of a particular group. Once the proper words have been memorized, practically any atrocity can be explained and justified as a noble act. Unfortunately, the majority of the world population knows very little of the actual history of these movements. And to them, this revolutionary rhetoric these high-sounding phrases can be very effective in concealing the reality until it's too late to resist. But let's get back to the subject of terrorism. It's obvious, I think, that no government is going to be toppled merely by a few bombs in public places, 
hostages held for ransom, or even by the assassination of public figures.